Good day, everyone. And a big hello from Dan, George, and myself, Nikki. Thanks so much again to all of you who have joined us from all over the world for what promises to be a fascinating virtual tour through the jewel in West Africa's crown, Ghana. Before we start, I wanted to make a quick mention that our very first webinar took place one year ago on June the 10th, when Stefan Lorenz showcased Sri Lanka. It has been an amazing journey with you since then, and we are very happy to be with you with our 38th virtual tour and have many more exciting destinations to still showcase in the weeks and months ahead. Right back to Ghana, this fascinating country has one of the only canopy walkways in all of Africa, a feature um, which offers some exceptional birding opportunities that are simply not possible anywhere else. Seeing birds like Congo serpent eagle, chocolate-backed uh, kingfisher, the white-crested hornbill at eye level is certainly something special. The country is probably most famous, however, for the opportunity it presents for viewing white-necked rockfowl, while other great birds like the Egyptian plover, the oriole warbler, are also high on the hit list. Keith Valentine, our rock jumper birding SA managing <coughs> director, mentioned to us today the many wonderful memories he personally has of Ghana which was one of his first forays into West Africa back in 2006, just after a tour to Cameroon. He described the forest as simply magical with so many specials and a little known species. It had also been amazing for him to watch how the country had opened up and rock jumpers knowledge of its birds, the niche habitats and where the specials reside has increased exponentially. Just a few years back, species like the Bormans, Greenbull, Capuchin, Babbler, and the red-cheeked Wattle Eye were hardly known from the country and the white-necked rockfowl, which was presumed extinct in Ghana, was only discovered in 2003. Dr. Daniel Dankwitz is joining us today from Johannesburg, from a very cold Johannesburg, South Africa, <laughs> and is no stranger to our dream destination webinars, having taking a, uh, taken us through Bhutan back in June last year and Zambia in August. Daniel grew up in Southern Zambia, where from a very young age, he gained a strong appreciation for all things wild. His weekends were spent wandering through uh, Dambos and Mambo woodland, always in hot pursuit of the next lifer or otherwise trying to persuade his family to join him on more uh, distant trips further afield. From the age of nine, uh, Daniel was already an enthusiastic bird watcher, but at the age of 10, he moved to South Africa to attend a boarding school. This move presented him with a smorgasbord of new potential lifers and opportunities to travel. After finishing his BSc honors and master's degree in zoology at the Rhodes University, Daniel completed his PhD, his greatest achievement to date, which centered around the population structure of tropical seabirds in the Indian Ocean. This research has critically influenced the conservation of several threatened species and has springboarded many future research projects. We are all, we are Almost about to begin, but before we do, just a reminder that we always love fielding your questions. So if you have any questions or you just want to say hi, please um, use the chat function or the Q&A box and we will have a questions and answers session at the end with Dan and George. And on that note, over to you, Dan. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nikki, and thank you uh, to George for co-hosting this evening's webinar. Tonight's webinar has been a very long time in the making. It's been a long time coming. 
in that Ghana certainly is one of Rock Jumper's top birdwatching destinations that we travel to. In fact, Ghana was one of the very first destinations that we ever visited on a Rock Jumper tour. And it's just grown in leaps and bounds in the years that have followed. Ghana has quite quickly become uh, recognized as one of Africa's top birdwatching destinations. And as Nikki so kindly introduced in that uh, introduction, the infrastructure with Ghana, within Ghana has been structured around visiting birdwatching groups. So it provides access to one of the largest and only canopy uh, forest walkways in all of Africa. There's specific sites centered around specific birds where uh, the entire community gets involved, not just in showing you the birds, but in the conservation of the forests that the birds live in. So I'm sure many of the fellow guides who will be listening this evening would agree with me when I say that Ghana certainly is the jewel of West Africa. So where exactly is Ghana? Well, Ghana is a West African country. It's located a few hundred kilometers to the west of the Gulf of Guinea, which is the armpit of Africa, if you have a look on any African map. And it's sandwiched to the west by the Côte d'Ivoire, or the Ivory Coast, and in the east by both Togo and Benin, with Burkina Faso up in the north. Ghana is a coastal country with an estimated 350 kilometers of rich coastline on its southern border. Now, West Africa has a, as a whole is broadly defined uh, by two main biogeographic regions. So these are regions that are characterized by uh, partic particular assemblages of species that exist within uh, those areas. And you can see these two areas shaded in this map that I've included here. The red area is known as the Upper Guinea uh, Biogeographic Zone. And you can see that Ghana is right at the very eastern edge of the Upper Guinea Forest Zone. The Lower Guinea Forest Zone, which is highlighted in green, has been extended subsequent to the production of this map to now include larger areas of Cameroon, Gabon, and a huge portion of the Demogra demographic Republic of Congo. Now together, these forest zones are the largest uh, intact stretch of forest anywhere on the African continent. And as I'm sure you would anticipate then, the number of species that these two zones uh, collectively uh, hold is just incredible. We're looking at about 416 species of mammal shared between the upper and the lower Guinea forest zones and about 917 bird species uh, between these two zones. So that's more than a quarter of all of the mammals found on the African continent and just half of all of the birds found within Africa. Now, in terms of the endemics that West African countries uh, hold, these two particular zones, the Upper Guinea and the Lower Guinea forest zone, hold 18 endemic birds in the Upper Guinea zone and 30 endemic birds in the Lower Guinea zone. Very few of these countries have uh, endemic species that are restricted to only one country, but you have these uh, very big special birds that are uh, distributed throughout these two forest zones. Now, the two zones are separated by a biogeographic barrier known as the Dahoney Gap. And you can quite clearly see that uh, in this image, uh, in that gap of the forest running through Togo and Benin there. And this is a climatic barrier, a drier area of, the West, of West Africa that has a distinct savanna type habitat, whereas most of the rest of the um, coastal parts of West Africa are dominated by forest. And if you have a look at a climate map for West Africa, you can quite clear, clearly see the break in the rainfall uh, that falls in this West Africa. And those two uh, shaded blue areas quite closely match the distribution of the Upper Guinea and Lower Guinea forest zones. Now, in terms of the endemics, 
these two forests or this uh, biogeographic barrier has separated species uh, on either side of the Dahoney Gap. And this has led to the rapid evolution of, uh, of uh, birds and all uh, different types of animal in both the upper and lower Guinea forest zones. And perhaps the prime example of that, and it's a group of birds I'm going to be talking quite a lot about this evening, are the rockfowl or the picathartes. So down in the bottom portion of the slide, uh, bottom left, we have the white-necked picathartes, which is a white-necked rockfowl, which is an Upper Guinea endemic, and the grey-necked rockfowl, which is a Lower Guinea endemic. But then if we have a closer look at the climate within Ghana, you can see that there's quite a clear gradient from the southwest of the country where there's extremely high rainfall all the way up to the northeast of the country, which is a much drier area. And so within Ghana, we see a graded habitat going from this rich, uh, mature tropical rainforest with these incredibly tall emergent trees all the way up to a fairly dry savanna type ecosystem. And then in the extreme north of the country near the border of the Sahel, uh, sorry, near the border of Burkina Faso, we get into Sahel type habitats. Now, for those who may not be familiar with that term, Sahel is a, a dryland habitat that surrounds the Sahara Desert. It's that sort of uh, patch of vegetation that occurs on the immediate border of, um, of the Sahara. And what this translates to is an extremely high species diversity. Ghana has over a bird list of well over 750 bird species. And for a country of this size, it is uh, really, really impressive. Now, like I mentioned, very few of the West African countries, perhaps Nigeria and Cameroon aside, have any endemic species. But Ghana supports 15 of the 18 Upper Guinea forest endemics. And this is a primary reason why Ghana is so well recognized as a bird watching destination. So among these species, we have things like the little green woodpecker, the recently described blue moustached bee eater, white tailed alethi, uh, white breasted guinea fowl, the mythical rufous fishing owl, western wattled cuckoo shrike, and of course the list goes on. But perhaps the bird that Ghana is best best known for is the white-necked rockfowl, sometimes also referred to as the yellow-headed picathartes. Of these Upper Guinea endemics, there's only three species that cannot be seen within the boundaries of Ghana, and these are the Gola Malimbi, the Sierra Leone Prinia, and the black-headed Rufus Warbler. And as the name of the Prinia suggests, in order to see these three species, one would be required to do a trip to Sierra Leone, where many of the other Upper Guinea forest endemics are a possibility, but the infrastructure in uh, Sierra Leone isn't quite as good as uh, Ghana yet, hence why Ghana is so uh, widely recognized as the top bird watching destination in all of West Africa. But Ghana is also the easiest place in Africa to see several of the continent's top birds. And this includes such incredible species as the Congo serpent eagle, the Inkalengu rail, Egyptian plover, both Akun and Fraser's eagle owl, standard wing nightjar, long-tailed hawk, white-crested tiger heron, and this list just goes on and on and on. And I have to say, of that list of birds, Virtually all of those species are possible on a single visit to, uh, to Ghana. And considering these are some of Africa's rarest and uh, most sought after bird species, that really is something quite incredible. And lastly, within Ghana, it's possible to see all but one of the endemic African bird families. So for the family listers who may be listening in this evening, uh, this is something that uh, make, that sets Ghana apart from most other African countries. And of course, the only uh, endemic African bird family that cannot be seen within Ghana 
is the shoe bill. And in order to see the shoe bill, one would need to travel to either Uganda or northern Zambia. Now, something else that makes Ghana so special, particularly where us guides are concerned, is the caliber of the local guides that we work with. Many of these gentlemen that you can see in this, uh, in this image have worked together uh, with Rock Jumper for many years now. These are the Ashanti brothers. They're all immediate brothers. And they've been trained over several generations now, uh, running through this, this family uh, to lead bird tours in Ghana. And they are always so eager and so uh, willing to share um, elements of their country with you. Uh, always so incredibly friendly, and they always have the biggest grin on their face. So an absolute pleasure for us guides to work with, and really a highlight for the clients on all of our tours to travel alongside some of these uh, people who are so passionate and so willing uh, to share elements of their country with you. So what tours do we do to Ghana? Well, Rock Jumper offers three different tours to Ghana. Uh, the longest of which is the Ghana Mega Tour. Now, anyone looking to visit Ghana and wanting to do it thoroughly uh, should look no further than the Ghana Mega Tour. In 22 days, we quite literally cover the entire country, and it's possible to see between 400 and uh, sorry, 450 and 500 species on this particular tour. And that includes 12 or more of the Upper Guinea endemics. Now, given that we spend a lot of time in the forests in Ghana, we do keep uh, the group sizes to a minimum, to eight people. And this group is always accompanied by one rock jumper tour leader, as well, well as one of the local leaders that I spoke about. It is important to mention that on this particular tour, the, the accommodation is quite basic at some points but it is otherwise uh, comfortable throughout with air, condition, uh, air conditioning uh, in all of the hotel rooms. The second tour that we offer is the Ghana Comprehensive Tour, which is a slightly shorter tour. It's only 16 days. And given the slight reduction in the number of days that we spend in the country, there is also a slight reduction in the number of species that you could expect to see on this tour. And one would expect anything around 420 species, including 10 of the Upper Guinea forest endemics. Now, group size on this tour uh, ranges anything from about six guests through to uh, 10 guests, and it's always accompanied once again by a rock jumper tour leader, as well as the local leader. And here we stay at com comfortable accommodation throughout the tour, the only difference between the Ghana Mega and the Ghana Comprehensive Tour is we visit an extremely remote site on the border of the Ivory Coast on the Ghana Mega Tour, which we do not do on the Ghana Comprehensive Tour. And the final tour we offer is what we call the Ghana Budget Tour. The term budget here is uh, rather misleading. Um, but it's a much shorter tour and spend a lot more uh, time within, um, we do fewer sites and concentrate more of our time on doing those sites thoroughly rather than rushing from site to site to site. So those looking for a uh, much more relaxed uh, trip to Ghana, this is the tour for you. We would expect anything around 275 species on this tour, including seven of the Upper Guinea forest endemics. And it's important to note as an important distinction between the mega and comprehensive tour, this group is only accompanied by one of the local leaders, but this needn't be an off-putting uh, feature of this tour in that, as I said before, the local guides that we work with are some of the most incredible local guides you'll see anywhere in the world, uh, and they are more than capable of running uh, these sorts of intensive uh, tours by themselves. So where do we go? Well, on the mega and the comprehensive tour, we follow a very similar itinerary, spending a lot of our time down in the south of the country, working a number of different forest sites. 
we do then uh, make the great trek up to the north of the country to Mole National Park and then all the way up to Bolgatanga and the Tono Dam right on the border of Burkina Faso. In the far west of this map, down at the bottom, you'll see a pink pin labeled Ankasa. That is the only site that we do on the Ghana Mega that we do not visit on the Ghana Comprehensive Tour. Otherwise, the two tours are almost identical. And to compare that to the Ghana Budget Tour, when my computer decides to catch up with me, Sorry, I'm having a slight technical glitch, but I'm sure it will uh, catch up with me shortly. There we go. Uh, so as I mentioned with the Ghana budget tour, we do a far reduced number of sites uh, within the country, spending most of our time down in the South, uh, but we do these sites more thoroughly and we spend more time in each site. Uh, to give ourselves a better chance of seeing the birds without rushing around uh, so much. So just some extra things to note before you go. Ghana requires a moderate level of fitness. We spend a lot of our time birding on foot in that we are in forests, but the topography of Ghana is rather flat and so a lot of the walking is not demanding. I will, however, say that one of our sites does require a reasonably long uh, hike, a 12 kilometer uh, return trip uh, up to the top of what's known as the Atewa range and then back down to the bottom, but nothing, uh, particularly, um, nothing particularly strenuous. In terms of the timing, all of our tours are run between October and March, which is the dry season in Ghana. But in saying that, Ghana is extremely uh, tropical, it's coastal, and so the climate is pretty warm and humid throughout, and there's an excellent chance of rain, and so it is important to be prepared for that. In terms of comfort, Ghana is rather basic in terms of Western standards but the accommodation is pretty reasonable throughout and it does include uh, um, air conditioning in most of the rooms and the food within Ghana, I have to say, is absolutely excellent. Uh, some of the best food you'll eat anywhere in Africa and I'm a big foodie, so I can certainly, uh, certainly comment on that. Transport, most of our transport is done in air-conditioned buses, but for those coming on the Ghana Mega, it's important to note that there is one portion of the tour where we will need to break up into uh, smaller 4x4 vehicles to access some remoter parts of the country. Photography is tough in Ghana, and this speaks to the ease of birding too. We spend a lot of our time in forest and forest birding, as many of you all know, is quite challenging, uh, but it is rewarding in the same breath and that many of the species that we see are brightly colored. Um, although bird density is quite low in Ghana, we visit a number of sites throughout the country. And so come the end of the tour, there's a very good chance that we'll see all of the top species and it's important to note that the Picathartes, the white neck rock file, has never been missed on a rock jumper tour to Ghana. But what else can you expect? Well, as I mentioned, Ghana is an extremely tropical, uh, tropical country. We spend a lot of our time in the south of the country in uh, rainforests. About three quarters of the tour is in rainforest, and it's a very wet forest. We spend uh, sometime in the southwest of the country where uh, the forest can almo almost be described as swamp forest. Uh, but we work these open glades as well as forest rivers and watch for these uh, mixed species foraging flocks that move through the country, uh, through the, uh, these open patches of the forest. We also explore some secondary habitats, some farmland at the forest edge, some open uh, swampy areas, as well as the cocoa and rubber plantations, which are the two main crops grown in Ghana. 
but we spend time within these plantations in that many of the forest specials will regularly come out of the forest to feed in these sec secondary habitats. But to see some of the top specials, we do have to go into the thicker parts of the forest. And the forest in Ghana is unlike anything uh, you would have seen before. These huge, tall emergent trees that stand um, hundreds of feet out of the uh, forest and this incredibly thick, dense undergrowth, which is part of then why uh, the Kakum Canopy Walkway, which I'll be uh, talking to you in a few moments time about, is such a blessing within Ghana. But Ghana is also an incredibly vibrant and colorful country. Uh, the people in Ghana are some of the friendliest people I've encountered anywhere in Africa. They're so interested in, uh, in foreign visitors coming to the country. They're so willing to uh, share aspects of your life. So it really is a fantastic country to travel through. Now, in terms of cultural highlights, one thing that we do, uh, do on all of our tours to Ghana is visit the Cape Coast Slave Castle in the city of Cape Coast, which is just a few hundred kilometers to the west of Accra, the capital. Now, on my first visit to Ghana, this was something that I hadn't really given too much thought to ahead of the visit, but it was one of the absolute highlights of my time in Ghana, visiting the slave castle. And however somber the experience it is, it was an, it's an incredible uh, experience to go and see, uh, see these castles and to hear some of the facts about um, this incredibly dark time in human history. Now, for those who don't know much about this, I thought I'd share just a few facts about it. And at the end of my talk, if you would be interested in uh, seeing and hearing some more of this, I have a link to a website where it's possible to go on a virtual tour of this slave castle. Now, the Cape Coast Slave Castle was constructed in the year 1555. And at that point, it was just a simple Portuguese trading post dealing mainly in ivory and in gold. Now, at the time, Ghana was known as the Gold Coast in that it has incredibly rich gold reserves. But over the years that followed, the, the Cape Coast uh, trading post uh, changed hands between the Portuguese, who initially constructed it, the Swedish, the Danes, the Dutch, and finally the British. And through the six, uh, 15 and 16th uh, centuries, um, the interest in Ghana changed from the, sorry, the 16th and 17th centuries. The interest in Ghana changed from its gold and ivory reserves to its people. Uh, the people of Ghana were uh, used to the heat and humidity of their home country. They're incredibly strong people. And so um, the slave trade was born. Now, the Cape Co Coast Castle is thought to have involved an estimated 30,000 slaves. At any one point in time, over a thousand men and 500 women were housed in the most horrific conditions within this uh, castle. Disease ran rife in that they, um, they were kept in totally unimaginable conditions without any kind of water and sanitation. And so those estimates are probably grossly underestimated, just in that we have no record of the number of people who died in captivity. The slaves would have to be kept in these uh, cells for months on end as they waited for the ships to, uh, to come and uh, fetch them. And once they were picked up, they had to walk through what you can see in this image, which is the gates of no return. And it was uh, commonly known that if you pass through the gates of no return, that was to be your last experience of your home country. An estimated 10 to 15% of the slaves that were taken 
then died at sea on the crossing to the New World, and many of them were destined for the Caribbean. So it's estimated that a total of 12 million people were involved within the slave trade industry in all of West Africa, many of these people uh, being sent through the Cape Coast, well, well through the uh, Ghanaian slave castles. So it really is an, a sobering and a uh, chilling um, aspect of human history to learn about. But eventually slave trade was abolished in the year 1807 and Ghana became the first African country to gain its independence in the year 1957. On a slightly less uh, so, uh, sombering note, Another cultural aspect that we uh, include on our Ghanaian tours is a visit to the Larabanga Mosque up in the very north of the country. Now, this is a cultural highlight only for the Ghana Mega and Ghana Comprehensive Tours. We don't go far enough north on the Ghana Budget Tour to include this. Now, this particular um, Islamic mosque is considered to be the oldest Islamic mosque in all of Ghana and one of the oldest, oldest mosques in Africa. And it was originally constructed in the year 1421 in a traditional Sudanese architecture. So we visit this mosque uh, to learn a little bit about the history of this iconic building, uh, sometimes known as the Mecca of West Africa in that it's a site of important Islamic pilgrimage uh, within the country, but it also then happens to be a site for one of the most special birds within Ghana, and you can't take uh, birders anywhere without their binoculars. So while we're at the Larabanga Mosque, we certainly keep our eyes out for uh, said special bird. Another highlight from Ghana, of course, is the visit to the Kakum Canopy Walkway in Kakum National Park. Now, this is one of only three such canopy walkways in Africa, and it's one of the largest canopy walkways anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. The walkway is center, centered around seven tall emergent trees and is connected by over 350 meters of rope bridges. The tallest platform stands about 40 meters above the ground with perfect views overlooking the top of the forest canopy. Now I can hear through my computer screen the stomach rumbles uh, in all corners of the world uh, for those who, like me, are petrified of heights, but birding at the top of the Kakum Canopy walkway is really one of the top bird watching experiences anywhere in Africa. The platforms that are surround these tall emergent trees are uh, perfectly stable, uh, enough that one can even erect a telescope there, and they provide a fantastic vantage uh, from which to watch over the forest canopy, and they offer wonderful access to uh, forest species, uh, forest canopy species that you normally only see as small blobs from uh, the bottom, from the forest understory when viewing from below. So really a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to see these birds at eye level. Uh, some of Africa's top birds can be seen from the Kakum Canopy Walkway. But traveling through Ghana does come with its challenges, as you can see in this image. Um, bear in mind, we do visit during the dry season, but even in the dry season, uh, it can be quite an experience to get to some of these sites, and uh, that in itself is a lot of fun. It comes with a very strong sense of, a very strong exploratory feel, um, and it's a lot of fun going into these areas where uh, very few Westerners have ever visited. But now on to the birds, uh, the real reason I think many of us are here. It would be totally unfitting to start any uh, mention of the birds without first introducing the species for which Ghana is perhaps best known, and that is the white-necked rockfowl or the yellow-headed picothartes. 
Now, until the year 2003, the species was believed to have been extinct within Ghana, um, only until uh, some small colonies of them were found breeding in some remote forest patches in the north, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, central parts of the country. Today, a lot of the bird watching in Ghana is centered around visits to see the white necked rockfowl. And it really is one of the top experiences anywhere in Africa. So, this is an entirely community driven initiative. You arrive in the community, and the community is just a buzz with people uh, coming out to uh, introduce themselves and to then take you into the forest. So visits to see the rock file have gone to benefit these local communities. They've led to the construction of a number of schools as well as clinics and they contribute towards the conservation of these forest patches. So it's the community members that take you up to uh, see the rock file, and um, they have constructed benches at the cave systems where the rock file uh, nest. Now to jump back to my previous slide quickly, if you have a look in the very back uh, of the image near my red arrow, you can see a number of strange mud uh, nests that have been attached to uh, to a rock face within the um, within the forest. As the name rock fowl suggests, these birds are strongly tied to rocky habitats within the forest, and they construct their nests on the leeward overhanging side of these huge boulders within the forest. So one needs to hike up into these remote patches of the forest. It's not all too far, two to three kilometers of walking. And then you sit and you wait. And all the, although the birds won't necessarily be nesting at the time of year that we visit, they regularly come back to roost at the nest sites. And so these birds are virtually guaranteed. Seeing a rock file is something like seeing a football being kicked through the forest and that they quite literally come bouncing through the forest as uh, if you could imagine a football being kicked through the forest. It's a peculiar bird. They have this uh, incredibly sleek and elegant gray and white plumage, these long legs that are perfectly adapted through, for bouncing through the forest. And then this weird bald head with quite a large bill and three random, almost hair-like uh, structures that come out of the top of uh, the head. The rockfowl are, um, there's two species of rockfowl, this obviously being the white-necked rockfowl, which is the Upper Guinea forest endemic, and then you've got the grey-necked rockfowl, which is the Lower Guinea forest endemic. Now these two species are each other's closest relatives, and they're uh, the closest relatives of the rock file then are the Malaysian rail babbler on the totally opposite end of the world, as well as um, the rock jumpers within, uh, within South Africa. But they are something of a, a um, genetic anomaly. No one can quite figure out where these things belong. Uh, but what's clear is that they are such a primitive and uh, ancient group of birds uh, that have existed through the West African forests for, for many, many years. As I mentioned, they build a weird cup-like nest, almost reminiscent of a swallow's nest on the underside of these boulders, and they come in each evening to breed. Uh, sorry, to roost within their nest. So we arrive at the forest in the mid-afternoon, we hike up to, uh, to the nest sites, and then we sit and we wait. And after um, a little while, you see the birds come bouncing in, and they can be quite uh, conspicuous. They, um, they uh, come bouncing through, they come and check you out, and uh, so it's a lot of fun to watch these birds, really one of the top uh, bird watching experiences you can have anywhere in Africa. Some of the other Upper Guinea forest endemics include the sharps at Palis. This is the male, which has the black throat. The female has a rufous throat. The very rare Nimba flycatcher. 
yellow bearded green bull, which is one of a very high diversity of green bulls that occur within Ghana, um, a guide's worst nightmare, but uh, really, really interesting, interesting birds nonetheless. The red fronted ant pecker, which is a particularly scarce bird, it tends to associate, as the name would suggest, with ant swarms. And another bird that tends to associate with these ant swarms is the white tailed alethi. Now, anyone who's ever tried to look for an alethi will know just how difficult these birds are. They have been nicknamed ghost birds in that they will quite literally circle you uh, calling, but you will have no chance of seeing them. Uh, luckily for us, however, white-tailed alethi is fairly common in Ghana, and so there is an excellent chance that we will get good views. And when you eventually find a confiding individual, uh, views like you can see in this photo are indeed a possibility. Our next Upper Guinea endemic is another fairly scarce one, little green woodpecker. There is a fairly high diversity of woodpecker species in Ghana, including some absolutely fabulous species, and little green woodpecker is one of the most special of the lot. Another group that's well represented in Ghana is the hornbills, and brown-cheeked hornbill is one of Africa's larger species of hornbill. Uh, also an Upper Guinea forest endemic, um, but we have a very high diversity of hornbills in Ghana. It's sometimes possible to see up to eight different species in a day. Uh, so really a fantastic area for hornbills. And the last Upper Guinea forest endemic that I'm going to be showing you is perhaps the most beautiful of the lot. And that's the blue moustached bee eater. I see I've got a typo there, unfortunately, but uh, blue moustached bee eater. This has uh, recently been split off from a more widespread species in Africa, and it now has a very uh, localized distribution in West Africa. Another big top West African special is then the Inkulengu rail. Try say that three times faster. Now the Inkulengu rail is a fairly widespread species throughout Central and West Africa, but it is virtually mythical throughout its range. And Ghana is perhaps the best place anywhere in Africa to see the species, particularly that site down in the Southwest of the country near the border of the Ivory Coast. The species spends its days running around on the forest floor and it's virtually impossible to see at that time. The only chance you have to see the species is at dusk when the birds go up into the forest canopy, as you can see in this image here. And the birds call once and once only in the day. And when they're calling or when the call is uttered, that is your only opportunity to get to the birds to see them. So what we tend to do is go and wait out on a remote stretch of forest road at dusk and we hear the birds calling and the local guides charge off into the forest to go and try and find them before the call stops. And then once they found the bird, they come and fetch us and take us safely uh, through the darkness of the forest to see these birds roosting high up in the canopy. Now, I hope the sound is going to work. I have a recording here of the bird's call. It's certainly one of the most unique sounding bird calls anywhere in the world. So I'll see if I can get it to play for you. Dan, unfortunately, it's not playing on our side. It uh, would have been, uh, yeah, it, it won't play, unfortunately. But we, won't play. we can edit it in. What we'll do is we'll edit it into the recording so that um, up on the website we'll have it uh, there for you. 
Sure, thank you, Nikki. So I would certainly recommend uh, tuning into the recorded version of this uh, webinar at a later stage and just listening to the call. Alternatively, have a look on Zenacanto or uh, one of the other libraries of uh, bird calls and give the call of the Inkulengu rail a listen. It sounds like a witch doctor's chant or a Congo drum that's uh, echoing from the deepest, darkest parts of the forest. And so there's a huge uh, level of mysticism that surrounds the Inkalengu rail uh, in, in Ghana, really one of the most special birds in the country. Then concerning some of the uh, endemic African bird families that are on offer, one of the most popular is always the Taracos. And this species, the Western plantain eater, is usually one of the first birds that you will see upon landing in Accra. Of course, it's a far, uh, rather drab version of this endemic African bird family, but don't fret, once you get to the forests, uh, you have a chance of several spectacular species, including the violet taraco, yellow-billed taraco, and a very iconic sound from the Ghanaian rainforest, as well as the great blue taraco, the largest member of this endemic African bird family. This is a rather scarce species in Ghana. It's more easy to see elsewhere in Africa, but it certainly is a possibility on the tours that we offer to the country. The endemic African barbets are also well represented and beard, bearded barbet is always one of the most popular. It's one of the largest of the African barbets and another popular species is the violet barbet. The endemic African parasitic finches are also a possibility and the exclamatory paradise wider is certainly one of the best birds in all of Ghana. This is a species that we tend to see up in the north of the country uh, in the dryland areas. Africa's smallest bird, the Titalia, measuring just a few centimeters across, is a distinct possibility within, uh, within Ghana too. Um, and the helmet shrikes, are also a distinct possibility. The red-billed helmet shrike being one of the best species in the group. I do see that George has just posted a link to the call of an Inkulengu rail in the chat function of the uh, webinar. So if you would like to have a listen to the call, uh, please have a look at the chat function while I'm talking and you will see a link that, that has been posted there. The African broadbills are possible in Ghana and rufous-sided broadbill is always an incredibly endearing species to see. You can see from this image just where that bird gets its name. It has this really broad base to the bill, um, but this species is really spectacular in the sense that it performs something of an aerial display. Now, my call didn't work, but I really hope that this video will play for you. This is the display of the Africa, uh, the rufous sided broadbill. I hope that worked. I will play it again for you. So the rufous sided broadbill tends to find a, a small vine in the forest and it perches there, the male perches there. And in an effort to try and attract a female, he does a little somersault uh, from his perch landing back where he left to reveal that white back. So this is always an incredibly popular bird to see within Ghana and one that we have an excellent chance at finding. Some of the country's other top special birds include the capuchin babbler. Uh, this is a very, very special bird with an incredibly limited range within the country, but we do have an excellent chance at seeing the species. The violet-backed hyliota, 
which is possible in um, several of the forested sites. And this is one of several species where uh, the Kakum Canopy Walkway is such a fantastic opportunity through which to see the species in that they tend to stay quite high up in the canopy. Another woodpecker that's always popular in Ghana is the fire-bellied woodpecker, a fairly scarce species, but one that we have an excellent chance at uh, at several sites within the country. And then sunbirds are very well represented within the country, and arguably this is one of the best sunbirds in the world, the buff-throated sunbird. The male has just a small patch of green iridescence on the top of the head and on the throat, but is otherwise characterized by this very unusual rufous plumage and this broad buff uh, band around the throat. Another top special is the Joanna's sunbird, um, another species that tends to stick to uh, high alt uh, the higher um, sections of the forest. And down in the coastal sections, we have a chance at the striking Carmelite sunbird, another brown sunbird with uh, limited patches of iridescent purple in its plumage. Perhaps one of the uh, most underwhelming sunbirds in the world is the mangrove sunbird, quite an unusual bird in that it has no iridescence in its plumage at all, and both the male and female are identical, having this mouse brown plumage. Now the species is also sometimes referred to as the mouse brown sunbird, and as the name suggests, it's a big mangrove specialist so we look for the species at a number of sites along the coast where we have access to mangrove habitats. Other special birds in the country include the black-throated kukul. This is a bird that's fairly common in Ghana, but it's a nightmare to see. Uh, on my last trip to Ghana, it took until the very last day of the tour to see this bird, uh, in spite of hearing it virtually every day. Um, but it is a frighteningly secretive bird, despite its large size, uh, but it has a wonderful bubbly call. They're sometimes referred to as rain birds in that they call um, in the, oh, just before and just after rain. One of the most jewel-like birds in all of Ghana is the red-necked or red-cheeked wattle eye, a very special bird that you find in the forest understory, um, a really, really special bird to Ghana. Ten years ago, this bird was an extremely rare bird in Ghana, but as uh, we've been able to explore the country more, we found more and more sites where the species is now possible, and it is one that we have an excellent chance at seeing. Africa's smallest woodpecker, the African picolet, just a few centimeters across, is a distinct possibility on the tour as well. It is quite a scarce bird within West Africa, but a very, very special bird nonetheless. This is the only picolet to occur within Africa. Um, picolets, of course, are quite widespread through the uh, Central and South America, and then there's two or three species in Asia as well. We do spend a lot of time not just in the uh, birding the canopy walkways, but also down in the forest understory, and there's a number of really interesting robins that we look for, including the forest scrub robin and the forest robin this surely one of the cutest birds that occur in Africa. A group that's very well represented throughout the African continent, although there are two species, three species in uh, Asia, are the honey guides and this yellow-footed honey guide, you can quite clearly see where the bird gets its name, is one of the top specials within Ghana. Keeping with the drab theme, Green bulls are very well represented, and perhaps the, both, uh, the best looking of the lot is the western nicotor, but we have a number of other slightly drabber species, including the Bauman's olive green bull, a very special bird, the simple green bull, 
and the Western bearded green bull. Now, these are just four of the green bull species that are on offer. There's a very long list of green bulls that one can see in Ghana. Like I said earlier in the talk, they are a guide's worst nightmare. Uh, but once you get uh, familiar with all the different species uh, and we have ample opportunity to see all of them, they do become quite easy to separate from one another. An iconic bird in the West African forests is the velvet mantled drongo. And this is one that we see a lot of from the canopy walkway. Again, the canopy walkway provides a fantastic vantage to uh, see these forest canopy species at eye level, where normally we just view them from below. A number of other species uh, that we see from the canopy walkway include the Malimbis. Now, Malimbis are one of my favorite groups of African birds in that although these are relatives of the African weavers, they have this extremely distinctive black and red plumage, some species showing uh, li limited patches of yellow in their plumage, but the blue-billed malimbi, crested malimbi, and red-headed malimbi are just three of the four possible species that we have on offer. And once again, viewing them from the canopy walkway at eye level is always fantastic. The emergent uh, dead branches that we see from the canopy walkway are also a place to watch for a number of aerial feeders, including the blue-throated roller, a forest roller that we see uh, it's a very widespread species, but this is perhaps the best place to see it and that we do get views at eye level, as well as a number of interesting bee eaters. This is the rosy bee eater, and this is the black bee eater. Now, I'm willing to put money on the fact that black bee eater is one of the most underwhelming names for an otherwise pretty spectacular bird. Um, I think whoever named this bird uh, could have come up with a number of much, much better options for the species' name. There's also a number of really interesting forest finches that we see in Ghana. Orange-cheeked waxbill, a very delicate bird, tends to prefer the forest edges where you have grasses and sedges. And the striking western bluebill, uh, quite a large finch. This is the female with uh, that's those spotted underparts. They tend to prefer the thickets of the forest understory. Like I said earlier, hornbills are well represented and the white crested hornbill is a distinct possibility. Um, in fact, these birds are often found perching on the stabilizing wires of the, uh, of the canopy walkway and the red-billed dwarf hornbill, which is one of two species of dwarf hornbill that you can see in Ghana. And as the name suggests, dwarf hornbill, they really are minute little birds. The canopy walkway provides a fantastic place to watch for uh, birds, uh, birds of prey soaring overhead. And two species that Ghana is very well known for include the mythical Congo serpent eagle, an extremely rare bird, as well as the long-tailed hawk. Now this is a fantastic bird. It has an incredibly iconic silhouette with that very long thin tail. And these birds tend to, it's a squirrel specialist and their long tail is perfectly adapted to hunting squirrels uh, through the thick forest, uh, the long tail linking to the agility of the birds. For those joining us on the Ghana Mega, we visit that site on the border of the Ivory Coast, which is an area of uh, swamp forest, and we explore sections of forest where the, uh, there's a few forest pools, where we have a distinct chance at seeing specials like the white crested tiger heron, the shining blue kingfisher, and the minute jewel-like white-bellied kingfisher, a very rare bird within Africa, this being one of the best sites to see the species. Another bird that we look for in these forest pools is the Hartlib's duck, which is Africa's only true forest duck. It has this tendency of associating with 
uh, isolated forest pools. And while we're looking for that species, another popular bird is always the African finfoot, which we have an excellent chance of seeing in, uh, in Ghana. Now, when we do our night walk to go and try and see the Inkulengu rail, we'll keep our eyes and ears peeled for a number of other very special birds that are possible to see in the forests at night. And this includes things like the Lathams or the Forest Franklin, the Akun Eagle Owl, one of Africa's most special owls. And in fact, it's possible to see both Akun and Fraser's Eagle Owls on the same evening in Ghana. And if you're very, very lucky, it is possible to see the West African race of African Pitta at one of the sites that we visit in Ghana. This particular image was actually taken in Sierra Leone on a night walk up there. But recently, some groups have been seeing these West African Pittas on night walks in this region of Ghana. It's not all forest birding up in the north of the country. When we go to Mole National Park in Bolgatanga, we enter some more open savanna type habitats and some uh, Sahel dryland habitats. And there it's possible to see species like the Bruce's green pigeon. Um, as I'm sure you can see from the images I've been showing you, there's a definite theme uh, of colorful birds in Ghana. Uh, the pigeons are no exception to that. There are some fantastic game birds. This is the white-throated Franklin, quite a scarce species in Africa, as well as the stone partridge. Now, coupled with the Nahans partridge, which is an East African bird, these two birds are something of a ta taxonomic anomaly within uh, in Africa. They have um, affinity more to uh, Asian groups than they do to African birds. And so stone partridge is one that we do keep our eyes and ears peeled for. The beautiful white crowned cliff chat is definitely a possibility too, uh, particularly at the very start of the tour when we visit a site known as Shy Hills. And this is a recent split from the more widespread mocking cliff chat, which has an entirely black head. The open savanna habitats are full of different bee eaters, and the white-throated bee eater is arguably one of the um, one of the best for that. Uh, well, one of the best bee eaters in the country, but another popular one is always the red-throated bee eater. Keeping with the theme of the aerial feeders, Ghana is fantastic for a number of localized swallow species including the scarce pied-winged swallow, swallow, the beautiful white-bibbed swallow uh, with this uh, entirely iridescent blue plumage relieved only by that limited area of white on the throat. The species that we look for at the uh, mosque, this is the red-chested swallow, uh, vaguely similar to the uh, barn swallow, the widespread European species, uh, but it has this uh, broader area of red on the throat and an incomplete iridescent blue breast band. Another recent split is also the West African swallow, which we have a distinct possibility of seeing. And then rollers are quite prevalent up in the north of the country, including species like the blue-bellied roller, and the Abyssinian roller. One of the most popular birds in the country is always this species, the yellow-crowned gonalek. It's actually a type of shrike related to the booboos or the bush shrikes in Africa, but very brightly colored and with a beautiful call often given from uh, dense parts of vegetation. Um, and some fantastic starlings too, including the long-tailed glossy starling. A number of finches can also be seen up in the north of the country, perhaps the best of which is the bar-breasted firefinch. But as I am now drawing to a close with the list of special birds uh, to be seen in Ghana, I've left the best two species for last. Two of perhaps the most iconic 
and unique birds anywhere on the African continent are a distinct possibility in Ghana. And these are the standard winged nightjar. You can see the bird sitting on the left, but it, this being a male, they have these incredible standards that come out of the wing. It's actually coming off the shoulder, not necessarily a wing feather, um, with this long, long shaft, and then these two huge feathers on either side. When you see this bird, it almost looks as though you're looking at three individual birds. You really have to look closely to see uh, the, the shaft that connects the feather to the bird. And then Egyptian plover, the last bird species I'm going to be showing you from Ghana. Now this bird, is we travel right to the very north of the country on both the uh, Ghana Comprehensive and the Ghana Mega Tour. We visit the Volta River and explore areas of sandbank for the species. Uh, they are quite reliable on the sandbanks. They tend to associate with crocodiles, strangely. Uh, so this bird is also sometimes called the crocodile bird. And then in terms of other wildlife, well, Ghana isn't necessarily the best African country in terms of seeing other wildlife uh, as far as a safari destination goes. But there's an incredibly uh, diverse uh, assemblage of butterflies that occur in these forests. And one of the sites that we actually visit is a butterfly national park. And it's got a incredibly high diversity of butterflies of all shapes and sizes uh, with every color and variation uh, you can think of. So it's really quite something to see such beautiful and uh, unique butterflies within the forests of Ghana. Of course, uh, there are some primates and the uh, Mona monkey is definitely a possibility. Now the Mona monkey is actually the species after which Kakum National Park has been named. Kakum National Park being the largest national park anywhere in Ghana. Uh, the reason behind this is the Mona monkey uh, the sound it makes is vaguely rem reminiscent of kakum. And then, of course, the potto. Now, the potto is an incredibly ancient uh, mammal. It's got a quite a strange creature, very slow moving, uh, short tailed, uh, bears resemblance to a sloth or a bush baby, uh, but a tree sap specialist. Um, and a nocturnal mammal, one that we have an excellent chance of seeing on some of our night walks within the country. Primates are quite re well represented and some of the other species we anticipate seeing include the Calithrix monkey as well as the Patas monkey. Now the Patas monkey is a very widespread species across uh, much of the Sahel. Um, I've seen the species in the very north of Uganda, and it goes all the way across uh, the northern third of Africa and is possible in the north of Ghana too. Some of the more obscure wildlife that we keep our eyes peeled for include the dwarf crocodile, the smallest crocodilian on Africa, really a tiny little creature, um, but a possibility while we're looking for Inkulengu rails and white crested night herons. An interesting array of bats, including this yellow winged bat, certainly one of the most unique bats with those nasal appendages and these uh, huge ears and bright yellow uh, wings. The white bellied hedgehog is a possibility as well as a number of species of mongoose, including the Gambian mongoose. Then just in terms of larger mammals, it is uh, one uh, could expect to see African elephants in Ghana, um, right up in the north of the country when we visit Mole National Park. Cobb, a type of antelope, is a possibility. And then there's a range of different uh, scarce forest mammals th that are a possibility including things like bush pigs, uh, pangolins, um, and uh, forest elephants. Um, so some really, really interesting things to look out for. These creatures do tend to be quite uh, scarce and reclusive, so we don't uh, necessarily see them on every tour. 
but every once in a while you do get lucky. So let's get planning. When are we next running tours to, uh, to Ghana? Well, we have four different options that are going to be going ahead in the foreseeable future. I have to say that Ghana has got a um, has got almost full control over the uh, COVID outbreak within the country. I checked and there were only 50 new cases reported within the country today. So it is still a rather safe uh, country to travel through. Uh, so we have a Ghana and a Ghana, com sorry, a Ghana mega and a Ghana comprehensive tour that will be running through November of this year as well as November of next year. There's then a Ghana small group option, uh, which will be led by one of my colleagues, Greg de Klerk, and that will be in March of 2022. And then in terms of the Ghana budget tour, we actually have a tour that uh, has only one remaining space on it, running between the 25th of October and the 7th of November this year. This tour will very likely go ahead. So if you are interested in visiting Ghana, I would recommend um, contacting the office as soon as possible to try and secure your space, for which I do provide the uh, contact details at the bottom of the slide. And on that note, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed this virtual tour of Ghana. And as promised at the bottom of the slide, I include the link to the Zamani project. And if you would like to partake in a virtual tour of the slave castles, it really is something that I would recommend. Um, it's something that completely blew my mind and totally changed my um, ideas on the uh, history of this dark time in uh, human history. So it's really worth going and having a look and uh, seeing it for, for yourself. I would certainly recommend it. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to uh, Nikki and to George, and they can take it from here. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dan. Very informative and some incredible images as well. Um, then just quickly before we go off to Q&A with Dan and George, I just wanted to let you all know that our next Dream Destination webinar, we're heading back to South America and more specifically Guyana, which ticks all the right boxes for a Dream Destination with iconic sites of interest and a string of bird and mammal highlights. Guyana is fast becoming one of the most desirable places for keen birders to visit. Highlights abound from harpy eagle to giant anteater to the Guyanan cock of the rock, throw in some of the continent's rarest birds such as the sun parakeet, rear branco, ant bird and the red siskin, uh, plus some crazy species like the capuchin bird and you have a very special country to explore. So join rock jumper guide uh, Lev Fred as he details some of Guyana's incredible highlights and get a real feel for what the country is all about. Also a reminder that our webinars are recorded and can be viewed later. The links will be available with the next 24 to 48 hours. And, um, or simply you can go onto the Rock Jumper website under media, under webinars, and you can view all previously featured webinars. And then finally, these webinars are being offered free of charge, but should you wish to donate towards our tour leaders, um, the GoFundMe link is still open and uh, in your chat um, box. Thank you and over to you, George and Dan, for a round of Q&A. Super, thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Dan. <clears throat> a really great uh, summary of Ghana, a place I've never been and really have been fascinated for a while. I uh, wrote up one of our image of the month featured the, the rock fowl, and uh, it was interesting to write about a bird I've never seen before. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was in reading uh, about the Picathartes, the rock fowl, it says occasionally, and I've never heard about this from anyone I've talked to. It seems like people, when they see them, they're going to roost at night. But occasionally they mention in some of the literature that these things actually will go around in little groups sometimes 
uh, on the forest floor. And I, I just have a lot of trouble envisioning that, but I was wondering if you'd ever encountered anything like that. I haven't personally encountered that. My only experience with seeing the rock fowl has been going up to the uh, colonies sitting and waiting for the birds to come in. Uh, away from the colonies, the rock fowl are extremely shy and I think they hear us coming a lot uh, sooner than um, we know that they're around and they're quite agile and they hop out through the forest quite quickly. Uh, but from what I do know about them, they are quite social so they do move around. They do have a tendency of following ant swarms um, and so uh, you can have multiple birds following the same ant swarm, but it's very, very rare to actually see one of these birds in the forest, um, and uh, it would uh, it would um, certainly be something special to to see it in that way. Cool. Yeah, that's it's one of those things. When I read it, it just kind of knocked my socks off. It was hard to believe. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Tristan Jobin commented that this was a great webinar and said they wanted to thank you for that. Uh, had a question also as to whether you would recommend uh, Ghana as an introduction to African birding uh, if someone has never been to Africa before. I certainly would recommend Ghana as an introduction to Africa tour, but it would uh, depend on what you're hoping to get out of, uh, out of an African tour. Often on a first tour to Africa, um, clients are interested in combining uh, mammals with the birds to get uh, the big five and everything like that. And in that regard, Ghana isn't necessarily the best when compared to other destinations such as Kenya and South Africa. But from a bird watching perspective, Ghana can certainly hold its own uh, relative to those other destinations, South Africa and Kenya as examples. And so if your primary objective is seeing uh, the special birds of Africa um, over perhaps seeing all of the mammals on your first trip, then absolutely Ghana is the place for you. Um, you're seeing some of Africa's uh, most sought after and most unique birds, as well as for the family listers, you're getting all but one of the uh, endemic African bird family. So uh, I think there's very, uh, very few other countries elsewhere in Africa that can um, claim such a, such a high um, list of target species, uh, including all of those uh, bird families. Excellent. And speaking of the mammals, uh, Tracy Cook was wondering what the difference is between our Ghana tours in terms of the mammals that that uh, one might see on each tour? Is there, um, you know, one particular area where most of the mammals are seen, or can they be seen at a uh, variety of spots? And maybe you could compare our, our three different offerings there in terms of how the mammals stack up. Perfect. So. Uh, the Ghana Mega and the Ghana Comprehensive Tour both concentrate on sites down in the south of the country. And then we do go up to Mole National Park, just north of center, and then Bolgatanga, right at the uh, northern uh, limit of the country. Most of the iconic African mammals, the elephants and the uh, large antelope and things like that, are seen in Mole National Park, which we do not visit on the budget tour. The budget tour, we stay down in the south of the country, concentrating on a few of those forest sites. Um, so if mammals are a priority, then I would recommend either the mega or the comprehensive tour over the budget tour. And if time is a limit, um, once again, I would recommend the mega in that you get the most thorough experience of Ghana but if time is um, a limitation for you, well, then that comprehensive tour isn't too much longer than the uh, budget tour, but we do make the trek up to the north of the country. So you will get elephants and uh, some of your more iconic mammals. On the highlights tour, in that we spend a lot of time down in the forest, we spend most of our, well, the mammals that we anticipate encountering are mainly squirrels, uh, a selection of primates, and if you're extremely lucky, you may be able to see 
one of the scarcer forest antelopes, which are typically small, uh, but those are generally fleeting views. So uh, you don't really have the opportunity to stop and admire them like you do up at Mole National Park. Excellent. Uh, field guides, what, what book um, or app would you recommend? You can speak to the seasonality at the same time. Um, it, Gonzalo Elias had asked, uh, he, he said that he thought the wet season is best for breeding birds and seeing breeding birds and breeding plumage. Um, and was curious if maybe you could speak to that. So a lot of the, uh, the birds that we anticipate seeing in Ghana don't necessarily have a distinct uh, breeding versus non-breeding plumage. Some of the finches, of course, um, I showed an image of the exclamatory paradise wider. In the non-breeding season, they do tend to be rather drab, but birds aren't necessarily breeding in the heights of the rains, just in that it's too wet for them, uh, that there's a chance of their nests and things being inundated. They're breeding at other times of the year, uh, but most of the birds that we're looking for remain vocal throughout the year. Um, and so there, one does have an excellent chance of seeing them in the uh, dry season when we do visit. In addition to that, um, the uh, risk of rain and the disturbance that rain uh, then imposes is greatly reduced. Uh, so I hope that answers that part of that question. Then in terms of the field guides, I've just had a look here. I've got these two books myself. There are a number of different options. Um, the Helm field guides have two different books on offer. There's a Birds of Ghana, which is specific to Ghana, as well as a Birds of West Africa. There are also a number of slightly more recent publications. Um, there's an Atlas to the Birds of Ghana, um, which is fantastic, published by Turakal Press. Um, but perhaps one of the best books for a trip to Ghana is the Birds of Africa South of the Sahara, um, which although bulky is fairly comprehensive, uh, it does include all of the species. Um, it's mostly up to date as far as the taxonomy is concerned. And as far as the illustrations go, they are, or that is the best book uh, in my opinion. Cool, thanks for that. Uh, a couple specific questions um, about certain areas we go to in Ghana. Um, Ben was curious about what the target birds are in the Nkasa area. I think I'm hopefully pronouncing that correctly. Uh, and George Ledeck was curious if we're aware of the commercial mining threat to the Atua range. Uh, so to begin with the Nkasa question, Nkasa is for, just as a reminder, uh, for um, those who may have forgotten. Ancasa is that site that we visit in the extreme southwest of the country on the border of um, the Ivory Coast. That image that uh, I showed of the vehicle stuck in the mud was actually taken at Ancasa, just so you have a bit of uh, reference for how remote this area is that we go into. Now, this is an area of lowland swamp forest. And so all of those birds that tend to associate with the forest pools, things like white-crested tiger heron, um, white-bellied kingfisher, spot-breasted ibis, uh, inkulengu rail, uh, that is by far the best chance we have of seeing all of those species. And hence, that's why we go there on the, S on the Ghana Mega. They, all of those species are possible at other sites that we visit on the tour. Uh, so for the comprehensive tour, those species are a distinct possibility elsewhere, but to have your best shot at seeing those species, in particular the Inkulengu rail, um, it is uh, necessary to go to Ankasa. That's where we have by far our best chance at, uh, at that bird. 
Excellent. And what about the, again, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Kalakpa area? What is the significance there uh, and, and uh, why is it worth visiting? So Kalakpa is an extremely interesting area. Now, I spoke earlier about the Dahoney Gap, that biogeographic barrier, that uh, area of open savanna that separates the uh, upper Guinea forest zone from the lower Guinea forest zone. Now, Kalakpa is located at the very edge of that. So it's a fairly unique habitat dominated by open savanna with patches of gallery forest. And the two special birds that we look for there are the, um, the capuchin babbler as well as the Bauman's olive greenbull, uh, both very, very special birds and both with an extremely limited range within uh, Ghana, both extremely difficult to see elsewhere. So this is the most accessible site for those two highly sought after species. Um, just doubling back then to the uh, commercial mining threat to the Atewa range. Um, I had heard rumors that this was the case. I was uh, hoping that it wasn't the case, uh, but it does seem like some of that is going to go ahead. And it certainly does place um, a bit of uh, threat on that forest. Um, and that is very concerning for us from a bird watching perspective, but we're just going to have to unfortunately watch to see how that um, plays out. Luckily, the Atewa range, so it is a slightly higher lane area to uh, the rest of Ghana that we explore, um, but there aren't many species to see at the Atewa range that are entirely unique to the Atewa range. There are some birds that are easier to find there, but nothing that is particularly unique to that. Uh, so for things like the uh, rockfowl that are so habitat sensitive, uh, at least it wouldn't impact them, but it is certainly of grave, grave concern. Cool. And what about the, the you showed an image of the standard wing nightjar. Uh, there was a question about if um, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious to hear your, your take. Um, they, those feathers, those, dr those dramatic feathers that they grow, um, do they grow that way or do they preen those feathers down to the point that that's what is left? The, you know, uh, maybe you could talk about that a little bit for folks. So standard wing nightjar is one of two species of nightjar that we get in uh, Africa that have these ornamental plumes. The other one is the pennant winged nightjar, which has a long white trailing streamer and a very unique shaped wing. Uh, the standard wing nightjar's wing is fairly normal in uh, shape and structure relative to other species of nightjar. But then, of course, they do have that long display plume. So it is a display plume. The birds only have it for a very short time of the year, and they will have the plumes when we visit uh, Ghana on our tours. Uh, that's also important to note, only possible on the comprehensive and the mega tour in that it's a big Sahal special. So right up in the north of the country is where we see that uh, species, if I didn't mention that before. Uh, and it seems that the feathers, from what I know of them, uh, do grow out in that fashion, that it's that sort of long spoon-shaped um, tail feather. I know there's a few species, racket tail parrots in, um, in Asia, uh, some of the motmots and things in South America have a very similar structured tail where you've got this uh, stretch of an open shaft with a spoon-shaped bit of tail at the end. Uh, so I think it's grown in a very similar fashion to that. But because it does impede the male's flight when they have it, they do drop those feathers quite, uh, quite quickly. Excellent. And um, when our, our arrival is into the capital of Ghana, is that where we begin and end the tour? Um, do we see much there? Are we pretty much in and out? And is there any special gear that you recommend folks have ready for this trip? 
Um, so yes, yeah, sorry, I should have uh, mentioned that in the talk that all of our arrivals and departures are into Accra, the capital city of Ghana. It is one of the most accessible capitals in all of Africa to fly into. In fact, many of the flights that come into Africa directly from the States uh, pass through Accra as a refueling stop. I know a lot of the South African flights from the States go via Accra, then down to Johannesburg so they can refuel the plane quickly. So it's a very accessible um, place to get to. It's a very up and coming city. There's a lot of uh, development that's happening uh, within Accra. So a wonderful city to, to visit. It certainly would be worth tagging on a few extra days, either before or after your tour. In that, unfortunately, we do, as soon as we uh, we hit the ground running. As soon as we land in Ghana, we're already going out into some of the national parks and we escape the confines of the city uh, quite quickly. Now, in terms of what gear to bring to Ghana, uh, Ghana is incredibly hot and humid, um, particularly in the coastal areas where we're exploring those um, dense tropical forests that can be quite claustrophobic in the forest because of the humidity. Um, so light clothing, um, preferably pants that you can zip on and off as, as and when uh, you need to. It is good to have long pants. There aren't many biting insects and things within Ghana, uh, only up in the north. There's a slight risk of tsetse flies, um, but it isn't a... Uh, just to have very light clothing to make... Uh, make sure that you are comfortable. Then uh, good walking shoes and that we do spend a lot of our time uh, on foot. Uh, waterproof water walking shoes are absolutely essential in that although it is the dry season, it does get very muddy in places. Um, when we visit Ankasa on the Ghana Mega, I would highly, highly recommend uh, packing in some rubber boots in that it is a swamp forest, it, though we're not wading through water, it is muddy and you don't want your shoes to be uh, ruined as a result of that, so rubber boots would be good for there. And then rain gear is absolutely essential in that there is an excellent chance of rain on tour, even though we are visiting in the dry season, uh, the chance of rain is very definitely there and we will almost certainly be rained out on uh, some of the afternoons while we are in the country. Excellent, thanks for that. And one last question, Dan, as you mentioned, you are a foodie um, about the food, because uh, I, I feel like I don't know enough to call myself a foodie, but I'm always curious about the food. Um, and you said there were some really good uh, meals there. Is there any particular meal you really look forward to that you think folks will enjoy or, or a place that folks eat? And is there, maybe you can tell folks a little bit about some of the authentic uh, uh, Ghana food that we'll, we're likely to eat. Definitely. So I, uh, when I'm traveling through a country, I love to try the local food. I love to sample the local cuisine. Whether or not I like it is uh, irrespective. I still like to uh, sample the food. And the food that I have eaten in Ghana is arguably some of the best food I've had anywhere in the world. Uh, they do a lot of peanut dishes. Uh, peanut is a staple crop within, um, within Ghana. So a lot of peanut dishes, peanut soups, which uh, sounds rather strange, but uh, was surprisingly delicious and something that I thoroughly look forward to on my next tour back in Ghana. They have a fairly unique way of then cooking rice, that rather than steaming the rice to be nice and fluffy, they actually mash it up into a stodgy ball, and you'd eat that together with your soup, which uh, again, sounds a bit strange, but uh, certainly something I would recommend trying. Then a lot of plantain, and they, um, I'm normally a bit, unsure with plantain, but the Ghanaians certainly know how to how to prepare it. Um, lots of chicken dishes, so really, really uh, flavorsome and delicious foods. Um, 
often quite nutty and um, scrumptious. I really, really enjoyed it. Lots of fresh fish. Um, come to think of it the best. I absolutely love calamari. It's my favorite food in the entire world. And the best calamari I have ever eaten was in Ghana, coincidentally right next door to the Cape Coast Slave Castle. We quite literally saw the fishermen walk up from the sea carrying the, uh, the squid. The gentleman cut it up in front of us, put it on a barbecue and charred it. And we had that um, as the freshest calamari I've ever eaten and one of the best foods um, I've enjoyed. So I would really recommend trying some of the food. And um, if none of that would appeal to you, uh, they are very good at uh, doing some more Western style foods. Um, so don't be, don't be too concerned about being stuck with, uh, with foreign food for too long if it isn't uh, to your fancy. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you for everyone that stayed on uh, for Q&A. It was lovely spending the time with you. So from all of us from the Rock Jumper team, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, eh? Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.